any way, shape, or form, I want to, I want to minister to you. So if you've been having a tough week, I'm going to ask you to just do something. We don't do it enough around here, but I want you to step out and come down here. I'm going to pray for you. If you've been going through some, some challenges and some hard things right now this week, come down here. I'm going to just pray for you right now. This is your chance. Come on, don't stop. Don't stop. Play. Come on now. You're going through a tough week. And um, there must have been something something in the, uh, in the air this week because I know several folks that were going through some things, but it wasn't nowhere near as many as I know as that come down here. I just knew a couple. And, uh, you know, you just got to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. He knows a lot more than we do. Come on. And so I believe we will see the goodness of the Lord. Come on, somebody. We're going to see that in these people's lives, just like you're seeing it in your life. We're going to see it in their lives. Amen. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you that as we go to minister to these people, I thank you that your word will be true in their lives. It will be a fact. It will be the thing that they cannot just believe anymore. They'll be able to see it, touch it, have it. Lord, these hard things they've been facing this week, Lord, we just put a cease and desist order on those, and we say your word reigns true here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so, Father, we go to minister that this morning in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for that. We agree right now in Jesus' name for an end to this tough time. I thank you that right now in Jesus' name, yes, 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 the good things happen. The tough times end and the good times come. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The challenges go to the end. And the victory begins today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for great turnarounds. Lord God, understanding and peace, Lord God. In Jesus' name, I thank you for that. Now, for victory in their lives right now. In Jesus' name. Great turnarounds, Father. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I thank you for a great, great testimony. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. For a great turnaround right now. In Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord. The challenge ends and the victory begins in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We remain confident. Lord, I thank you that the challenge ends. Hallelujah. And the victory begins. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Now just throw your hands up. Thank God right now. Come on. The victory ends. Or the, the challenge ends. And the victory begins. Hallelujah. Today. Today it's ours. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 I will see the goodness of the If you're watching us online, and this goes for you too, there's no distance in prayer, there's no distance in the Holy Spirit, right there, if you've been going through a tough week where you are, just receive the, the power of God right there where you are, and know that the challenge is ending, and the victory is beginning, and it's happening for you right now, just like it's happening for these folks that are here with us, hallelujah, hallelujah, we will remain confident that we will see, come on, the goodness of the Lord, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, as we go to open your word today, we ask that you'll speak a great word to us. Lord, help us to be molded and shaped into the people you've called us to be. Lord, that we'll be able to step up higher, grow closer to you. Lord, we'll be more of the people you intended for us to be. We thank you for that. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Are you glad to be in the house of God this morning? Amen.
Well, praise God. Why don't you take a minute, turn around, step across the aisle, go to the back of the room, come to the front of the room, whatever you want to do. Hug somebody's neck, shake their hand, tell them it's so good to have them in church today. Amen. Matthew chapter 28 is where we're going to go this morning. We, uh, I don't do this very often where I'm not preaching in a series. Uh, I'm just kind of, I call these Lone Rangers, uh, Lone Ranger messages. It's like a, it's no tie into anything. It's just a, uh, just a message in and of itself. I kind of feel weird. Uh, saying all that, though, we are going to start a series next week. It'll be a shorter one. It's a mini-series. We're going to start a series on worship next week. I want to encourage all of you to come and be here, bring somebody. We're going to do some unusual things. We're going to have some, some stuff planned, um, and we're going, to, we're going to talk about worship, and we are going to do some serious worshiping next week. So make sure you come uh, and bring somebody. Um, we're going to do at least two weeks on it, and then we'll, uh, we'll reevaluate from there. It's going to be really good, though. We've got some, uh, some definite unusual things planned, all right? So Matthew chapter 28 is where we're going this morning. I want to, uh, first of all, thank you all for the birthday wishes. I uh, had my birthday this week. I call this birthday week, and I hashtagged it a lot on f social media this week because my son Peyton turned three this last week. Preston turned seven. All right, Peyton was on the 15th. Preston turned seven on the 19th, and I turned <clears throat> on the 20th. So 43. I, I, whoa. Uh, I turned 43 on the 20th, uh, and it was just a really crammed full. We celebrated every day. Uh, we went from last Saturday till this Saturday. We celebrated every day. We were either going to Disney or going to eat or, you know, we had Jody's family in for a while, and then my mom and dad are here this morning. They came in. Uh, they're sitting right here waving everybody so everybody knows who you are. This is JP and Nancy. They're uh, all the way from Kentucky. They... Uh, they didn't come down here to see me and Jody. They came down here to see Preston and Peyton. And then um, my dad decided to buy a car while he was down here. And I'm like, that's the real reason that you came down here. You found a good deal on a car. So uh, if you know my dad, my dad, if any of you have ever really talked to him, my dad's an old car guy. Uh, he loves cars. So we went down to Old Town last night. and looked. Anybody ever done that? Walked around, looked at the old cars down there? He was like just... I know that one. he was walking around. It was like an encyclopedia. That's a Bonneville. That's this. That's that. And that's the Chrysler. And then, and it's just encyclopedia, um, JP. So um, anyway, uh, thank you so much for the birthday wishes. And uh, those of you who keep texting me that are watching you online this morning, um, um, yeah, they're telling me there's no sound online. So did you guys get that fixed? All right, Leah. Hopefully you can hear us now. Leah, uh, one of our church folks that comes quite often, she's down in Tampa today. Um, and uh, then a buddy of mine just told me I look good in this vest. So thanks, Keith. Appreciate that. <laughs> so um, anyway, so uh, everybody watched online. Thank you so much uh, for the birthday wishes as well. We're going to talk about uh, today 
Um, a, a subject that I've been doing some studying along the lines of, and I wish that I could tell you this is going to be one of those real spiritual heavy hitting messages where you walk out of here and you go, golly, he just so revealed himself to me today. It, it is a very spiritual message, but it is not one of those. Okay, so if you shout this morning, praise God, <laughs> you're going to make me happy. Um, but hopefully you'll learn something this morning, all right? Um, I want to just talk for a minute about our since our existence as a church, we have kind of coined the phrase journey together. And I, every time I, I post something on social media, um, um, they, uh, um, I try and hashtag the words journey together uh, on our post because in, in what, we, what we've decided to build here as a church, we've always tried to, and, and, and we're always going to, really talk about doing this journey of life together. And it's more than just a pretty catchphrase, because I know there's a lot of churches out there that use, you know, phrases like that. But we really mean it, and we really want to, you know, when we were thinking about building this church and we were being led by the Spirit to build this church, um, we, we, we had this, this vision, if you will, of, of seeing... Uh, everybody, we're all heading in that same direction anyway. We're all headed in, a, in, a, in the same direction. We're all trying to go deeper in our relationship with Jesus. We're all trying to have a greater influence uh, for the kingdom of God here on the earth. And we're all going to get a reward in heaven because of Jesus. So we're all heading in that same direction. And you know, if we're going to all be going in that same direction, we might as well all go on this same direction together. Now, listen, I know that that's not going to appeal to everybody, and not everybody's going to come on this journey with us. They're going to have their own place they go take that journey, and that's okay. Um, but as far as, you know, I, I'm just going to basically talk to the family this morning. If you're visiting with us for the first time, please don't be excluded. I always say you're, you're only a visitor the first time, then your family from there on out. So, all right? So, uh, when I was a kid, we used to go to, um, down to... Um, down here to Florida every year, Daytona Beach, and we would, uh, y'all heard me talk about it a few weeks ago when my cousins were here, we would take a big caravan, and there would be 27, 28, 30 of us, something like that, coming down here, and it was this big caravan of cars driving down here from northeastern Kentucky, and it would take us two days to get here, and it's a miracle we made it that, because there were so many kids, and we all had to stop and pee, come on, y'all know what I'm talking about, all the time. And it's like, as soon as you get on, another one would have to, and we, we just stopped, you know. I would tell you a story, but it's kind of gross, so I'm not going to. So anyway, uh, we, were, we would do that kind of stuff, and it was always so much fun because you could just jump in the next car and sit with your cousins for a while, and then when you got tired of them, you could just jump in the, another car and have a whole other set of cousins waiting on you there, and, and uh, aunts and uncles, and, you know, whoever you got tired of, you could just jump in the other car, and, I mean, there'd be eight or ten cars and so we just, but the thing is, is even if I got tired of somebody, I knew that I was going to be with them here at the beach all week long. And so it's fine if I'm tired of you right now, I'll see you in just you know, a couple hours or whatever. And, and, and that was kind of my mentality. And what the Lord showed me about this starting this church is that, you know, uh, we're all going in the same direction. We're all going on the same, uh, the same place. Let's just do it together and have a good time getting there. Now, I, I mean, if I can help you get there, great. If you can help me get there, great. If I can pray for you about something going on in your life, great. If you can pray for me about something going on in my life, great. If you can pray for each other about something going on in your life, awesome. You know, and if you've been coming on Thursday nights, I, I pre preached about the prayer of agreement a few weeks ago, and I talked about that. I said, you know, it's great. You want me and Jody to pray with you, great. But you know what? We need to be able to pray for the, with each other and pray the prayer of agreement with each other. And so um, we've been, we, 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 we just kind of have that thing in mind, all right? Um, now, on a, any journey, there are bumps. There are, you know, stopping for pit stops. There are distractions. There are challenges. There are speeding tickets. No, that doesn't happen to any of you. Okay. And so... <laughs> My mom drove yesterday. We went down to the Serpentarium for Preston's, Preston's, Preston's birthday. Has anybody ever been down there? To Snake World down in the, for Preston's birthday party. My mom drove down there, and she was worried sick all the way there. She's like, I don't have my license. I don't have my license. I said, well, don't speed. You don't have anything to worry about. You know, 
all the way there. There are all kinds of things that can distract you on a journey. Um, but when you're doing this journey together to help pray, to help encourage, to help us do these things together, uh, we're ensuring that we truly are bringing as many people with us on this journey as possible. And I want to I speak to that for a second, because there's a lot of churches that are getting people started on the journey. They're getting people saved, mass evangelism, and that's great. I'm all for it. We will, we are, we've actually been talking about that, doing some evangelistic events, and I'm, I'm all for it. But I'm also of the opinion that it's more than just getting people started on the journey. That we need to help them get going on the journey and actually take that journey with them. And that's what Jesus called discipleship. There's too many churches that are getting people saved and then just, that's it. Okay, God bless you. And, you know, I don't know about you, but the Bible talks about there'll be a great turning away. Anybody know about what I'm talking about? There's going to be a great turning away, which means this. It doesn't mean that they're just going to say, like, okay, all you sinners go to hell. It's not that. <laughs> it's going to be there are people that have been saved that aren't going to make it there. Why? Because they didn't get put into them what it took to keep their salvation. Come on, somebody better pray. Amen, amen, better than that. All right? And so that's really what this journey together is all about is we want to get as many people saved as possible, but we want to also help people that are saved take their spiritual walk up a few notches. Come on. Several notches, all the way that they can maximize it while they're here on this earth, all right? And so we're not just going to uh, just get people saved, but we're going to assist people that are saved, all right? Matthew chapter 28, verse number 19, Jesus said these words, Go therefore and make disciples. That, that phrase actually means, if you look it up in the Hebrew, it actually, or the Greek, it means to cause people to become followers, now let's read it that way. Go, there, go therefore and cause people to become followers into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now get this part right here, underline this. Teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus didn't say here, go and introduce them to me and then run off and find the next person that you can introduce to me. He said, introduce them to me and introduce everybody else to me, but then teach them everything I've commanded them. Well, I'm just going to be honest with you. There's not enough churches doing that. There isn't. We're not doing the second part of this. We're not just, we're not just getting people saved. We're not making disciples. All right? When he said make, to cause people to make them followers, what he was actually saying, a follower is someone who is currently, and get this, and continually walking behind the leadership of Jesus in a conscious effort to be what he's leading them to be. Now let me say that again. To cause someone to be a follower is to get someone who is currently and continually walking behind the leadership of Jesus in a conscious effort to be what he is leading them to be. Now, that, that's a big, heavy theological definition there. But think of, let's break it down for a second. We want somebody who's currently following Jesus, and we want somebody who's continually going to follow Jesus. Okay? Okay? Great things about, about like the Billy Graham Crusades, the Reinhardt Bronke Crusades, is you see such a great harvest come in. But where are those people in six months, eight months, five years? So we want them to be current, yes, but then we want them to continue. But then we, in the church, it's almost like it's an accident if we get it right. It's like, man, I really hope I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Or, you know, it's almost like we kind of luck into things. It's almost like, well, you know, I was just reading and it just, I mean, it just happened to make sense that day. But you know what? You can consciously make the Word of God apply to your life. Don't shout me down now. You can make a conscious decision that you are going to understand what you read in the Bible. Now, I know that there's sometimes that we read it and we go, 
Who cares who begat so-and-so and and who begat so-and-so and and who begat so-and-so? I don't care about that. But you know what? You can consciously make that apply to your life. How? I don't know. I'm not you. (laughs) But you can consciously make a decision. And it shouldn't just be an accident. Listen, I know there are times that God blows our mind. Come on, Jim. That should aim, you should amen me louder than anybody right now. Jim had a great week this week. Getting a promotion. Come on, somebody. Amen. And so you consciously are, are going after the things of God in your life. You're consciously doing, and you're continuing to do it. All right? It, it, it's becoming what he's created you to be on purpose. And we have to get past this mentality that people say the prayer of salvation, that's good enough for the rest of their time here. We have to teach them to produce maturity in their life. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11. Now I want you to, we're going to talk about this. We're going to read this out of a couple of translations. Out of the New King James, it reads this way. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints. What do the saints need equipping for? For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head or Christ. Now I want to read this to you out of the New Living Translation because it reads a little easier. And, gr- and Christ gave gifts to people. He made some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to go and tell the good news, that's evangelists, and some to have the work of caring for and teaching God's people, that's the pastors. Christ gave those gifts to prepare God's holy people for the work of serving, to make the body of Christ stronger. This work must continue until we are all joined together in the same faith and in the same knowledge of the Son of God, we must become like a mature person, growing until we become like Christ and have His perfection. Then we will no longer be babies. We will not be tossed about like a ship that the waves carry one way and then another. We will not be influenced by every new teaching we hear from people who are trying to fool us. They, w- they make plans and try any kind of trick to fool people into following the wrong pa- path. No, speaking the truth with love, we will grow up in every way into Christ who is the head. Now he's talking about teaching people things that he commanded but he's not just talking about just spiritual things. You know, he commanded people to do things that, that have a spiritual impact, but it's not always spiritual teaching. Now, there is a big section of that. Listen, if you're going to be in a relationship with a God who is spirit, and you're a spirit, and you have a relationship with him, there is a big aspect of our life with God and our, and our relationship with God that's going to have to do with the spirit. But there's a lot of things that he commanded and, and, it, and it was con- continued on with the Apostle Paul that was just natural things that we're supposed to do here. All right? Now, I believe that we should teach about spiritual growth. We ought to be preaching about healing. I mean, if you've not been here for the last six weeks, we did a big series on, on being led by the Spirit. I believe we ought to teach about giving and receiving, on helping the poor, prosperity, you know, being baptized in the Holy Spirit. I, I believe we're going to teach on all that stuff. But I also think that one of the most important ways that Jesus wants us to teach is by you doing. You doing. Now, now when I say doing, I mean it in two ways. You ought to be doing the spiritual things. You know, you ought not be afraid to lay hands on the sick and see them get better. That should have got a better amen than that. If you can, listen, if you, if you are supposed to do it, and it says all believers, every believer should be able to do that. Come on. You, that, you, guess how you learn how to do it? By doing it. You know, you didn't learn to walk by just sitting there in the middle of the floor in your diapers. You crawled over to the couch, and grabbed hold of it, and pulled yourself up and started, started taking steps. And you know what? If you're going to do what Jesus commanded us, then you have to start doing it. 
Well, what if I do it wrong? You'll learn. It's not like God. Again, we got to get out of this mentality that God's like just ready for us to mess up and going to hit us in the head with a tack hammer. All right? We have to learn by doing. One of the things that we need to do is, is those things like that. We need to preach the gospel to every poor. Oh, I could never preach. You know, you ever heard that? Uh, the number one fear that people have is speaking in front of somebody else. Number two was death, which means most people at a funeral would better be laying in the casket than doing the eulogy. That's what that means. I could never preach. Well, you may not ever get up in front of a crowd like me or some of these other folks that go to church here. But somebody that goes to work with you or goes to school with you or somebody in your family ought to hear the message coming out of your mouth. I don't know. I don't know it well enough. Well, what do you know? Did he save you? Somebody ought to know that. What are we talking about? We're talking about doing. We're talking about doing. Doing what Jesus... You know, I mean, we ought to be able to... uh, uh, have all the rest of the things that should signs that should follow believers that should be happening for me should be happening for you we have to do now here let's let's take it back to the church for a second to our to the family we've been believing here for church growth we've been believing what are we believing for y'all we're believing for 150 on sunday mornings regular attenders not just one time shot I want 150 regular. Well, Brent, you're not believing big enough. I'm getting there. I got a stair step. I got to go where my faith is right now. My faith's at 150. Now, I surely, I want, sure, I want 1,000. Sure, I want 5,000. Sure, I want to have a, a building that's so big that people can't help but drive by and go, my God, that's huge. Yeah, I want to see that full of people that are getting ministered to. But where I'm at right now, I'm believing for 150. I want to fill up this one before we move out of here. So we're not just believing for numbers, though, for the numbers' sake. Now, I believe numbers do show fruit. But I want to say this. Numbers don't happen unless you, as a part of the body of Christ, grow in two areas. You have to grow as a Christian, and you have to grow as a servant. A church can have the greatest minister since the Apostle Paul, and you guys do. You're supposed to laugh. But even if the Apostle Paul isn't (laughs) surrounded, okay, listen, if he's not surrounded by maturing Christians who are willing to serve, that church is not going to grow. That church is not going to have large crowds. They may have one or two, but they won't be able to sustain it. If, If at best it will be Mass confusion. Okay? The way that you're going to be able to learn the best and get elevated in your walk with God the best is by doing. By doing what Jesus told you to do and by serving in the Lord's house. Oh, bad place to get quiet right there. Bad place to get quiet. All right? You are important and your spiritual growth... And willingness to serve is not just imperative for you, but it's imperative for the body. What do you mean the body? The body of Christ. Let's look at what it says here, back in Ephesians chapter 4. Look in verse number 12. Christ gave those gifts to prepare God's holy people for the work of serving. What's the work of serving? To make the body of Christ stronger now let's talk about this for a second i thought the body of christ i mean what does jesus need to be made stronger for well jesus himself doesn't need to be made stronger but we collectively come on somebody do we are not totally victorious like we should be the church should be totally victorious not just this church i'm talking about The Hebrew word ecclesial, all, the whole church, the body of Christ. We aren't as victorious as we should be, which means we got room to be made stronger. 
Well, how do we get made stronger? By doing what Jesus commanded us to do, teaching people how to command us, uh, what Jesus has commanded us to do. And one of those things is serving. By serving, you are sowing seed to God. Turn over to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. By serving, you are sowing seeds to God. Now, this is a very famous scripture if you've ever been around churches that like to do offerings, those big long hour-long offerings, you know what I mean? They preach an offering message, then they take up an offering, then they do an offering at the end of service. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> We're not going forward till 50 people come up here and give $1,000. They like to use scriptures like this. Luke 6, verse 38. Give, and you will receive... You will be given much, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It, underline that, it will spill into your lap. The way you give to others is the way God will give to you. Now, we have for years, especially in charismatic circles, have focused this scripture to mean money. And it does apply to it, sure. But it doesn't just apply to it. This is not just talking about money. I believe if you sow, sow money, you're going to re reap money. It's going to come back to you. I believe that. But it's not just that. It's it. Give and it. Okay? That's the way the King James reads it. Give and it will be given back to you. Good measure. Praise down, shaking together and running over. All right? It, the New, New Living says, it will spill into your lap. What's the it? Whatever you give. So how do you give outside of giving, you know, away something? How do you, how do you give? I mean, Brent, if you're not talking about money, what are you talking about? Well, give whatever. Well, one of the ways that you give is by serving. I was talking to Dana about this not too long ago, standing down here in front of O'Charlie's. He said, you know, this is how I, I give most of what I give to the churches with my hands on that bass guitar right there. What is that? Serving. It's giving. If you are only giving money and you only apply this to money, then that's what comes back to you. Praise God for that. But you know, some of you are believing for some other things besides money. Some of you are believing God for, for peace in your home. Well, are you sowing that peace? Some of you are believing for favor. Well, are you giving favor? Some of you are, are believing for help. Well, are you helping? If you want to gain more understanding of God in your own life, you ought to be giving of yourself to the work of God. If you want more understanding of your walk with God, then you ought to give what you understand to somebody else. Well, Brent, I'm not real well versed in Scripture. Well, what do you know about the, what, what the Bible says? What do you know? What, what is it that you have, that you grasp by understanding? Well, I know Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. I know. Then you ought to give that to somebody. Who should I give that to? I don't know. You know any little kids? They're probably singing right along with you, but give it to them. Well, you know, all I know is, is that, you know, I, I prayed this one time and God answered me. Then you ought to give that experience to somebody else. What happens by that? You are sowing that away, making room for, come on, more of that in your life. Well, I, I just, I don't know. I mean, I, I just can't say it like, like you know, like uh, those guys on TV can. Good. We got too many of them guys anyway. <laughs> you need to say it like you. If you want to gain help and friendship, you ought to give help and friendship to somebody who's needing it. Whatever it is you're needing in your life, you should give that to somebody else. Why? Because by doing that, you're sowing unto the Lord. Now, you remember that scripture where Jesus told the story about the, uh, there was people that were naked and you didn't help them. 
And then there was people that were hungry and you didn't feed them and they were homeless and you didn't take them in. And, they, and he said, but you, you didn't do it to me. And they said, well, well, Lord, where did we see you like that? And he said, well, whenever you saw them and you didn't do it to them, you, you did it unto me. See, that's what he's talking about. We give those things away because we're sowing to the Lord. And so when we serve in the Lord's house, we're not doing it for me and the pastor. We're not doing it, not even for the church itself. We're doing it for God. When we go to church somewhere, listen, this is a building and this is a body of believers. But when you serve here, it really shouldn't be to help somebody else here. You should be doing it for the kingdom of God. Well, what's the difference? It's a big difference. People are people. I'm a person. All these people sitting around us are people. But God is our Father. And He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the beginning and the end. He's the creator of the universe. And when I sow to people, it gets me limited results. But when I sow to Him, there's no end, come on somebody, to the results that He pours back out. So if I'm going to serve in God's house, we can't look at it as, I'm serving the house. No, you're not. You're serving the Lord. We're sowing seed into God, and He's the best ground there is. Now, sure, that applies to our offerings and our tithes and all that stuff. Yes, it does. But we're not talking about that today. <laughs> we're talking about serving. We're serving our time. We're serving our efforts we're sowing our lives into God. What happens when you sow life into God? You get more life. If I sow time into God, come on, what comes back? God. He sends back more time. We're not sowing to people. We're not sowing to me and Jody. We're not sowing into the church. We're sowing to God. We're, we, as a church, we're walking in obedience to what God has called us to do. And we believe that Direction Church is not just about Direction Church. That's a bad place to get quiet right there. We are not just about this for ourselves. We are not just about this for ourselves. We're about the cause of Christ. And we're about the moving of the Holy Spirit. Come on, we're about the preaching of the Word of God, and we're doing it in West Orange County, right here in the middle of Dr. Phillips, and we're doing it for the cause of Jesus. Amen? So anything that we do, we're not doing it for us. I'm not doing it. I, listen, when I said to y'all a few weeks ago, and I said, man, we're doing real good right now. The church has actually got money and savings. And I said, what are, we, what are we going to do with that money and savings? I said, I don't know. I'm going to go out and buy a car or something. And I laughed and joked around about it because that is so far from the truth. That, that is set up so that we can do some stuff here in the community. We're not doing stuff. Listen, I, I will never be one of those pastors that make you go and take an offering up for me and say, hey, to, just to bless me. And I know pastors that do that. I know pastors that take the first fruit of the offerings and they go, that, that belongs to me. I'll tell you what belongs to me. Whatever the salary the board of directors tells me to receive is what belongs to me. And right now, it's zero. Now, that doesn't mean for you to feel sorry for me and give me a $50 handshake at the door. That's not why I'm telling you that. <laughs> now, I got to say that because there's pastors and preachers out there that do that. I'm not telling you this to say, Brent, you know, Brent, you're telling us that to make us feel sorry for you. No, I'm not. We got partners and stuff outside of this, outside of what goes on here at the church. That, that's where we get our income from. So don't think I'm walking out of here with no money. I, we're fine. I'm telling you that because I don't want anybody walking up to the door and be like, here. <laughs> that's not why I'm telling you that. But we're sowing our time into what God's telling us to do. And so what are you getting at, Pastor Brent? I'm getting at, you ought to be sowing your time if you've been called here to come alongside us. You ought to sow your time into what God's doing here. Because, why? Because by sowing that into God, you actually start learning more about God. Why? Because you're sowing into God. Well, why do we do it? Well, we serve because we love people. We're not doing this for ourselves. Luke chapter 6, right there, back up to verse 27. But to you... 
who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks, and when things are taken away from you, don't try to go get them back. Do to others as you would like to have them do to you. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will, will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great and you will be truly acting as children of the Most High for He is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. That doesn't sound like the church. You must be compassionate just as your Father is compassionate. Do not judge others and you won't be judged. Don't condemn others or it will come back against you. Forgive others and you will be forgiven. And then he goes on into what we just read. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Now we all understand this, that when we do things to the Lord, we sow things, that there is a benefit to us. You know, you just can't help it. You do something for God, guess what? It automatically gives you a benefit. When I got saved, what was the automatic benefit? I'm going to heaven when I die. There's no other way of getting around that. That's the benefit. But you know, that's not the only benefit of you getting saved. You know what the benefit is now? It's to the everybody else that comes across your path. Amen. When you get saved, it isn't just so you can go to heaven. That's the side result. That's the result that affects you. But it isn't just for you. It is for every other person that doesn't know him, they can now have a chance to know him when they come across your path. You, there is a benefit that, that comes from serving God. But that's not our motivation. Our motivation is not to reap the benefits for ourselves. Now, this is why a lot of Christians don't walk in the blessing. They have a lot of selfish motivation of why they serve or, you know, if it, it does apply to giving. When you give finances, there's a lot of selfish motivation. Which is, this is why I'm serving or this is why I'm giving so that I can. And there are people, there are pastors and, and ministers that actually preach that. Give, you know, give, you know, uh, so that you can get something back. We don't give to get. That's just going to happen. So I don't want you to go sow a seed. Uh, oh, the only reason I'm sowing this is because I have this need. Listen, if I sow that seed in the right ground, it's going to come back to me anyway. I don't have to go and say, I'm sowing this special seed just for this. Listen, when I sow a, the seed, it's going to come back. Period. So now I, the question is, is where is it? Come on now, watch this. Where is it needed the most, Holy Spirit? Where is this going to help somebody? Because it's going to come back anyway. So now my motivation is just because I'm, I'm going to sow it just for that. You know, it's going to come back anyway. So now where do you want me to sow this, Lord, that's going to affect the most good for your kingdom? My motivation isn't so it blesses me. I don't go and serve. Listen, when we go and do stuff, we're serving here in this church too. We, we don't serve because it benefits us. Can I be, can I be transparent for a minute? I don't. I don't like getting calls at 3 o'clock in the morning to go to the hospital. I don't. We got, a, we got a doctor sitting amongst us. He doesn't like that either. <laughs> but it's a call. It's something that you do, right? That's what you do. It's, 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 it's a sowing into somebody's life. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, it doesn't benefit me at all to sit in a spiritual guidance session. It doesn't, doesn't really do anything for me mentally. But what's it doing? It's making more room for God in my life. 
So when you go and you serve the church or you serve God in, 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 in doing things in the church, you're making more room for God in your life. But that's not the reason. The reason is you love to obey Him. You love His people. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the famous love scripture, we read it only at funerals and weddings. Verse number four, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. Another translation of that says, it does not seek its own. If I could write down a definition for love, it would be love is the selfless promotion of someone else. Meaning, if I don't get anything back out of it and I made your day better, I've sowed love into your life. Listen, if you're just looking at what it does for you, your eyes are on the wrong thing. If you're looking at how uncomfortable it makes you, your eyes are on the wrong thing. If you're looking at how much time it takes away from you, your eyes are on the wrong thing. If you're concerned about how much you're giving up, come on, your eyes are on the wrong thing. When it comes to serving, you know, uh, when Jesus said, don't get weary in well-doing, but you'll reap a harvest if you, if you faint not. Listen, if you're tired already, you've been doing the wrong thing. It's not about us going and doing it, you know, doing it till we get tired. Listen, if you're worried about how tired you're going to be and how tired you are, you're not doing the right thing. But when we sow into God's kingdom doing what he's instructed us to do because we love people and love the, love the fact that we're trying to help somebody else, our motivation gets lined up and we don't get tired. Now, when I say tired, y'all know what I mean by that. Now, now sure, I ain't going to stay up all night like I did when I was 20 years old. We do youth lock-ins. Whenever we get to that stage, you can pretty much guarantee I'll be leaving at 1030. <laughs> all right? I'm not, I'm, if I stay up all night, that, that's going to rock me for about three or four days. And all 43 of them years are going to be like, how you feeling now? <laughs> I just ain't going to do it. I, I, I understand. Now, I'm not talking about physically tired. I'm talking about that drained, I can't do anything else feeling. When you sow into God, that feeling doesn't come. When you sow out of love for people, that feeling doesn't come. Why? Because you're sowing it in the right place with the right motivation. When we understand that our actions are bettering someone else, then we've got it right. When we understand that we're building up the body of Christ, we've got it right. When we understand that we, we are going to see his kingdom is worth my time and my effort, then we got it right. All right? Lastly, serving causes churches to grow. It just does. Acts chapter 6, verse number 1. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. Now I want to tell you what's going on here. The church is early church here. This is right after the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2. The church is blowing up. 5,000 getting added one day, 3,000 another day. I mean, it is, the Lord is adding to their numbers daily. Okay? Signs and wonders are happening. The apostles are preaching good. Miracles are happening. Peter's walking down the street and his shadow is healing people. I mean, we're talking amazing things are happening. Well, sure, the crowds are going to come out like crazy. And the church is going to explode. But even in the early church, look what happened here. There were rumblings of discontent. Now, this is the apostles' ministry we're talking about here who we all built our lives on, the teachings of Peter, James, and John, the Apostle Paul. This is all, these are all the pastors here of the early church, the board of elders, if you will. They even had people in the church that were not happy. So I don't feel too bad when some of y'all call and complain because they haven't been there. No, I'm just kidding. Now, here's what their discontent was. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers. Sounds like church problems. Um, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, isn't the Bible just great? And so, so brothers, 
Select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit of wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Everyone. That is a miracle of God right there. A unanimous vote happened in the church. Now, I don't know how the rest of you, I grew up in the church where you had to vote on everything. We want to buy a new van. Who's in favor of it? I. All opposed? Me. Why are you opposed? We don't need to spend the Lord's money on a van. Okay, you want us to spend your money? Go buy it for us. Everyone, I think that's so amazing. It says everyone liked this idea. And they chose the following. And then they go and they name seven men. Stephen, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor. I love biblical names. Timon. You think Pumbaa was there with him? Probably. <laughs> Parmenius and Nicholas of Antioch. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. Now listen, churches are hindered all the time by two things. No money and no people to serve. Now I'm not talking about money today, so we're going to move right on past that. But I want to talk to you about serving. Serving. Early church was hindered because they didn't have people in place to serve. By serving your church, serving God, you are furthering the work of the gospel in a greater way than you could ever imagine. Now, Billy Graham actually said this. Every volunteer you add to your ministry, you'll grow your attendance by four people. That's a paradigm shift from what we, the way we've traditionally seen volunteering in church. We typically think we need 25 volunteers for every 100 people in attendance. In reality, we get 100 people to attend every time we recruit 25 volunteers. Now, those of you who've known about this 150 thing that we've been believing for, uh, we actually did the math in the leadership meeting the other night. And we have uh, about 20 people regularly volunteering on Sunday morning. And you know what our attendance has been running? 80. It's deadly accurate how, off, uh, how right on this is. It is. I mean, I was like, okay, I wonder if that's really true. And when we did the math, and Taylor did the math while we were sitting there at the table, and Taylor's a physics guy, okay? So he's all about math and science, all right? Uh, and, 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 and we started thinking about uh, uh, what it's going to take to get to 150, and he did the uh, did the math right there. 37 people volunteering will get us at 150 people. Now you think, well, Brent, it's got to be more than that. Well, sure it is. I mean, I'm still going to preach good. Don't worry. <laughs> sure, we're going to make improvements in places. Sure. But I'm talking about you and serving. All right? If I had to identify the top 20 people in the church who were completely bought into the vision of the church, how many of them are volunteers? Every single one of them. The 20 people that volunteer, I would never in a million years question if they weren't sold out to the vision. This is what serving does. It causes you to sell out to the vision that God has in your church. All right? Now look what happened here. In order for your church to grow, spiritually maturing people have to start serving. Look what happened. Acts chapter 6, verse number 7. So God's message continue to spread. Now this is after he puts in the seven deacons, if you will. The number of believers, now notice it doesn't say just increased. Look at those words up there. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem. And many of the Jewish priests were converted to. You talk about influence as soon as they got people in line to start serving in the move of God, the church greatly increased. So Pastor Brent, okay, you got me. How am I going to start serving here? Well, what are you good at? I'm going to close with this. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 10. What do you want to do? Because I'm going to tell you right now, we want you. I'll take it a step further. We need you. I could get up here and, 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 and preach just as good as any, you know, I mean, it's arrogant sounding, I know, but I think I can preach just as good as anybody. 
Okay? I, I, I don't, I'm not insecure in saying that. I'm just, I think I, I think I do okay. So, it isn't just that. Okay? Uh, it, isn't just, it isn't just about the worship. It's not just about, you know, the children's ministry. It's about us getting this together. What do you want to do? Because we need you here. You are just as important to the body of Christ in this Dr. Phillips, West Orange County area growing and being successful as I or Jody or the worship team or anybody else is. First Peter chapter 4, verse number 10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to, look at that next word, serve others. As faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. I don't want everybody to come in here and everybody do the same thing. What good is that? If we're exactly the same, one of us is unnecessary. And it sure ain't me. I don't want a bunch of people. Listen, man, at Rama, this was they were the world's worst. Everybody graduated from Rama, especially in the '80s, and you could probably testify to this. Everybody wanted to be like Brother Hagen. They all walked around with their hands like this and pink, wings a little pinky, and they'd all, they'd all, they'd all. Everybody did that, or they'd twiddle the thumbs, and everybody had this Brother Hagen mentality. They all wanted to be Brother Hagen. Well, it's great, but we had a Brother Hagen. <laughs> we don't need another one. Then I went, when I went through in the 90s, Keith Moore was the teacher there. Now all the guys wanted to be like Keith Moore. They all tried to learn how to play the piano, and they all tried to sing in the spirit. And it's like, you know what? There are just some people that should never sit down to a musical instrument ever. I don't care if you do think the Holy Spirit's leading you. That's just nonsense right there. But we got a Keith Moore. We don't need another one. When I was teaching there in the, in the, in the early part of 2000 to 2012, uh, I had youth students that, that tried to do youth service like I did. And I'm like, I, you don't need to do it like me. When God made me, he broke the mold anyway. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, and I used to tell them, don't be somebody else. You see people grow up and underneath somebody's ministry and they try and be just like somebody else. Don't be like somebody else. Be you. We need you. We don't need somebody, uh, some, a replica of somebody else. Your gift that God's given you is imperative to this church because it shows God's grace in its various forms. And that's what we want to offer to you, is a place to let that gift out. A place to make that gift happen. A place that you can sow to God in love and cause his body to grow. Amen? That's my signal to quit. (laughs) Heads bowed, eyes closed, I'm done. Lord, thank you for our time together today. I thank you, Lord, that you desire to move in us, through us, with us, that you want our church.